Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Wong, and I'm an ethnobotanist. And I've got to confess that I have a slightly weird obsession with the relationship between people and plants, particularly when it comes to food. And that's because absolutely every facet of our evolution as a species, both culturally and biologically, is underpinned by that. Every possible aspect of humanity that matters is really guided by one thing, and that's the search for plants. And it's just as well that I find it interesting because that's exactly what us ethnobotanists study. So in recent years, there's a growing concern, some might say even a fear, for what we're doing to our food. There's this idea that somewhere in this transition between farm to fork, we're taking foods that are otherwise natural and wholesome and nutritious, and we're subjecting them to nefarious processes that are stripping out their nutrition. Um, a lot of this attention has been put onto the later stages of the production chain, so uh, processing, uh, marketing, distribution. But a very large part of this concern is, lies at the beginning, lies at the farm itself. Um, we hear things like, uh, oh, let's see if this comes up. Yeah, real food doesn't contain ingredients. Real food is ingredients. And to many people who hold this point of view, the supermarket is the, the ultimate epitome of a food system that is broken. People will describe it as having hundreds and hundreds of products that are so divorced from the wild ancestors of these crops um, that are taken from thousands of miles away that this does not work, that our food system is increasingly uh, reducing the amount of nutrition. I hear that with every successive generation, we have less vitamins and minerals in our crops. Your definition of generation can change, though, because sometimes people describe it with every human generation. Sometimes I, it's every generation of crop. Like I, recently, there was a claim in, uh, in Scientific American that said with every harvest of carrots, they become lower in certain nutrients. Now, I find this interesting um, because, oh, hang on, wait. Um, as a scientist, I'm really curious about whether these popular claims, pe claims that people believe so much, and it's not just in like the queue at Whole Foods, I hear these claims all the time. So I mentioned Scientific American, they had a cover story on it. Uh, New Scientist has had two cover stories on it in the last two years. Um, I'm curious about whether these facts or the, these claims are actually justified by the scientific facts. So I thought I'd take you through it. Uh, the one thing I can definitely tell you as a plant scientist is that re a real Food does contain ingredients. Ingredients are made up of ingredients. When you look at a, a blueberry, for example, it's really a complex chemical soup. They're just not legally mandated to print their ingredients on the packet. If you were to list the ingredients in a blueberry, they would look a little bit like this. If you were to read through it, there's very often uh, claims I hear in the media like, don't eat anything that your grandparents couldn't, uh, couldn't pronounce or couldn't recognize as food. In that case, my grandparents growing up in Wales couldn't certainly say quinoa. Uh, they couldn't say acai, or in fact, I don't, is it, is it acai, is it acai? I have no idea how you pronounce it. A lot of these things here that people may fear are already existingly in their crops. And as plant scientists, we can do amazing things. We can manipulate the chemistry of these plants in very dramatic ways, uh, both by growing them naturally, but also by breeding them in certain ways. Um, so as early as the 1970s, we have discovered that there's a, a term called the dilution effect was coined. And we started realizing that as crop yields started increasing, the uh, mineral concentrations within those crops didn't necessarily keep pace. In the 1960s and 70s, we have this amazing thing called the Green Revolution, where agriculture is modernized and huge yield increases prevent deaths of billions of people. But there's a potential downside to this in realizing that some crops, not all crops, and some minerals are lower in those. And that's a, a potential major concern, and very surprising that this kind of quirk that was discovered in the lab wasn't really investigated properly until the 1990s. So not only do we know that that happens, we actually have plausible me mechanisms by how that could be happening. So firstly, we know that some crops um, 
Some uh, minerals in some crops are quite slowly taken from the soil into the roots of crops. Things like uh, uh, copper, things like iron, the, the transmission rate is quite slow. And a lot of fast-growing crops, or a lot of high-yielding crops, are made high-yielding by being fast-growing. They physically don't have time, in theory, to take up those minerals. We also know, and this is separate from minerals, um, a lot of the reasons why there is some justification for claims that organic food may be higher in some phytonutrients is because they're treated badly. They're grown mean. Now, crops that are grown organically, many people describe them as being happier and healthier and therefore packed full of nutrition. As a plant scientist, that claim is not backed by facts. Crops that are grown organically are generally under higher amounts of stress. And plants can't run away or hide from external stresses, so they fight back with a chemical arsenal. And paradoxically, those defense chemicals are very often the antioxidant phytonutrients, which have potential health benefits. So crops that are grown uh, in suboptimal conditions can sometimes be higher in phytonutrients by, by the very nature of their being stressed. So, it's not until really in the 1990s that we start getting trials that seek to compare, that actually seek to look at whether this is just a quirk in the lab or whether in the real world, like in real meals, is the nutrition declining. And the first person to do this, or one of the first people to do this, interestingly, was not a, like a scientist associated with the university. Um, it's a citizen scientist who just basically ran an incredibly beautifully simple um, study. And all they did was to find out whether the nutrition of the crops in the past has changed to crops today, is they just looked at nutritional tables. So they looked at the earliest ones from the 1930s, and they started comparing these with the, the more up-to-date ones from the 1980s and the, uh, the 1990s. And they, what they found was potentially shocking. Um, in one study by Davis in 2004, and this is uh, probably the fourth or fifth big study on it, um, there's an average fall of between 5 and 40% of some minerals in some crops. We're looking at a 17% fall in calcium, 23% uh, fall in magnesium, 40% fall in things like sodium, uh, and an 80% fall in things like copper. Now, I'm going to stress that this isn't all crops and all minerals. It's only 33% of crops. But this is really taken up by the media, and it becomes like the, this is a sort of cited as incontrovertible proof that crops are declining in nutrition. But there's a problem. So this is both studied in the US and also on my side of the Atlantic in the UK. And DEFRA is the, basically the government body that covers this. And so it's really considered very, very solid science, at least in the media and at least in public imagination. But there is a problem with these sorts of studies. And let me run you through it. So it, I'm going to tell you a story about how my grandma in Wales cooks broccoli. Do you know how long she boils this for? Like 10, 15 minutes, so it's really gray, and like proper British food. I probably boil it for like five to seven minutes. How long do you think they boiled broccoli for in the 1930s? So I'm kind of socially awkward and geeky, and like my idea of a fun Friday night is to trawl through the histor historical studies and look this stuff up. 45 minutes. I tried to recreate this at home, and I couldn't even take the broccoli out of the pan because it fell apart in the slotted spoon. So I have no idea how they actually tested it. Now, if you're comparing broccoli that's boiled for 45 minutes in the 1930s, and you're comparing it to modern broccoli that may be only cooked for five to seven minutes, there is a serious discrepancy between these two studies, particularly since a lot of the um, nutrients that are in the broccoli leach out into the cooking water. Things like vitamin C are water-soluble. So if you're fishing this stuff out, they're incomparable. Not only so that you, you have a, a discrepancy in methods, you also have a discrepancy in how things are written down. So does everyone know Popeye? So I used to watch Popeye as a kid. I used to think that you know, if you broke open a can of spinach, it had so much iron in it that it made you really strong. And in fact, so I make TV shows for the BBC, and one of the things they wanted to have, uh, they wanted to, to see if they could make a, a spinach soup that was so high in iron it rivaled a steak. And I had to tell them that basically, TV producers, that's a really nice idea, but basically you'd have to fill this room full of spinach to have as much iron as a steak. And they said, no, but you know, Popeye, spinach is famously high in iron. 
Yeah, it's famously high in iron because in the 1930s, a study put the decimal point in the wrong place on the amount of iron. So for generations, we thought that spinach had 10 times as much iron because in scientific papers, we tend to report the results of other papers. And the more they're reported, the more true that becomes. And it becomes in the public consciousness like broccoli is so like spinach is really, really high. It absolutely isn't. So that's a, one of the many problems with comparing old data. And a final one, in the 1930s, we didn't realize that tiny amounts of soil clinging to crops could actually contain more minerals than the entire crop itself, uh, particularly for things like iron. So really, if you look at any 1930s data for the amount of iron that's in crop, it's, it's massively overrated because they weren't washing the crops off. They didn't actually know that the soil was contaminating it, giving them completely unreliable results. So this comparing of two different data sets just doesn't work in a real scientific situation. What we really need is to go back in time and get hold of crops from the pre-Victorian era and compare them to today. But you know, even I, if I had a DeLorean, I'm not going back in time to find old vegetables. <laughs> I'm finding dinosaurs. <laughs> um, so the, oh, the, there's really no way in which this is absolutely really possible to do, except for these two guys. So this guy is called, oh, there's two gentlemen. It looks like I've just got the same photo from Google and flipped it. I promise you, I haven't. Just all British botanists in the 18th century looked like this. And when I trained at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, I can promise you that in the early 2000s, they still looked like this. Um, so these are two pioneering botanists from the 1840s. And what they did was they, ran, they started up the world's longest running agricultural experiment. It's still carried on to today. This is in the 1840s, 180 years later, it's about 20 uh, miles from my front door, it's still running. It's called the Broad Bork Wheat Experiment. And what these two gentlemen did is they planted up a field of wheat. And they collected samples of that wheat from that field. And they carried the same experiment the next year in the same field. And unbelievably, botanists are so little fun that we are still doing that in the same field to today. But what that means is we have a unique opportunity to look at the, the mineral content of grain over a 180 year period. And when you look at that, when you start out in like kind of the 1840s, nothing much changes. You carry on, you get up to the turn of the century, really nothing changes. You get up to the 1940s, you get through the war, nothing changes still. And then suddenly, in the 1960s, mineral content of the, the wheat in this field does start to decrease. And this, this study is really commonly cited. Like it's cited all, I saw a big sign of it at Whole Foods just the other day, um, that organic crops are significantly better than non-organic crops because modern agriculture is destroying the soil in some way and making it worse. This study is cited of that. What they didn't mention is this exact same trial also collected samples of the soil. And the soil, when tested, isn't lower in any of those minerals. In fact, modern agriculture is really, really good at, at testing soil and finding things it's deficient in and then replacing those. So we know it's not the soil. It's suggested that the introduction of new wheat crops, shorter, high-yielding wheat crops in the 1960s is the result of that. But this is just wheat in one field, one crop in one field, thousands of miles away from here. How can this be relevant in a global context? What we really needed to do, if the example really was comparing old varieties with new varieties, is to grow old varieties and new varieties side by side. So people have done that. We've done things like uh, Farnham et al. in, uh, in 2000, uh, looked at 46 different varieties of broccoli. Why did they pick broccoli? You think scientists are kind of obsessed with broccoli. They keep mentioning it. It's because broccoli is really high in certain things like magnesium and potassium, which the general population um, doesn't seem to be getting enough of. And what they found is, indeed, older, smaller varieties of broccoli tended to have larger amounts of minerals than, than larger varieties. But, and here's the big but, it was unrelated to the date that the broccoli was bred. It was just to do with the size of broccoli. So newer broccoli varieties could be just as good as long as they were smaller. They had a larger surface area, and minerals tend to be concentrated on the exterior tissues of plant material. So crucially, this study was not just done one year. It was done in two years. And the weird thing is they found 
that the differences in the smaller broccoli and the larger broccoli were half that of the differences depending on the year. Weather had a significantly larger impact on the broccoli mineral content than any other aspect, which shows that like these, there are so many confounding factors, it's really hard to pin them down. So I saw a, a study in The New Scientist, and really embarrassingly, I had to do a talk, and I had to tell them that pretty much everything in their article was wrong, um, which uh, one of the, th the uh, big articles that they, they put up was that new varieties of grapefruit are significantly less healthy. New varieties of grapefruit are bred to be sweeter. We're breeding the bitterness out of grapefruit, and that is a bad thing. Because if you look at Naringin, it's significantly higher in the older. The, the, has anyone actually had a white grapefruit recently? You pretty much can't buy them anymore. They've been replaced by pink grapefruit because they taste much sweeter and consumers tend to prefer them. And the argument was that these old varieties, these old bitter varieties were much better. So I asked them for which study this was based on because they didn't quote it, and then I did some digging. And I found there are two studies on, on grapefruit, and the other showed the exact opposite. In fact, the other study that was done actually showed that pink grapefruit had twice the amount of Naringa uh, as white grapefruit. Um, also, uh, pink grapefruit contains 34 times the vitamin A. Uh, it contains lycopene, it contains flavanones that are all higher than white white grapefruit. Uh, in a one clinical trial, they found that pink grapefruit actually was double as effective at reducing cholesterol than white grapefruit. And, bloody hell, one actually tastes good. <laughs> and this is the important thing. It doesn't matter. It really does not matter what's in a crop if you don't eat it. If you're twice as likely to eat grapefruit, and grapefruit sales have spiked since they've become sweeter, you're much more likely to be able to actually getting the chemicals that you need. Um, so th there's, mo there's more stuff about, you know, like there are new varieties of uh, broccoli now which have uh, three times the good coffin in them. They've been specifically bred for that. Modern varieties of carrots tend to have three times the carotene because people Consumers like orange carrots, so if you breed them to be more orange, the nicer looking for a consumer, you're also breeding them for the carotene because the orange coloration comes from the carotene itself. Um, so you really, when, you really don't actually see much of a, a trend until you start comparing and then amassing things together. So one study was done in which they, they trolled through all the other studies to find out if these falls were actually accurate. Now, these falls didn't exist in many things, but for one of the examples, copper, it seemed to be pretty high. I'm going to give you the example of 80% there, although it was actually between 30 and 80%, and this was dramatically higher than anything else. Now, the modern varieties do tend to contain, according to this one study, 80% less. However, the variation, the natural variation of copper between different crops is 1,550%. So basically, any research that's been conducted that has found any falls has never found them to be greater than the natural variation within crops. There is really no good evidence to suggest that crops actually are lower nowadays in any of the nutrients in the past. But um, this is, let me give you some examples of variation. So we know, now know that uh, this is my boring party trick as a botanist. I can tell you which side of the tree that apple was facing and which side that was facing. Because that red coloration there is created by anthocyanins that are produced by the, by the plant as UV protection. It's basically more tanned there. So I know that that was facing the outside of the tree and that was facing the inside. Apples at the tops of trees have often been demonstrated to contain twice as many antioxidants as apples at the bottom of the tree, and that's simply because of the exposure to UV radiation. Um, so these are apples on the same tree. Even different sides of the apple have different nu uh, nutritional benefits. Um, when you're looking at things like spinach, a study in the early 2000s actually found that spinach in supermarkets seemed to dramatically increase in the amount of folate, in the amount of vitamin K, in the amount of vitamin E, vitamin C, and vitamin A after harvest, post-harvesting. And it took the researchers a little while to figure out what was going on, and it was literally the fact that they were being exposed to the UV lights in supermarkets. The actual strip bulbs were making, was, the plants were still alive and reacting and becoming more nutritious as a consequence. Um, the 
so you can look at all of this, you can look at all of these studies, and you can try and figure out if there actually is a nutritional difference or not. All of those studies have shown that not to be the case. But there is a question on why we're actually doing those studies in the first place, because plants don't contain minerals for our benefit. They don't contain them. They only produce vitamins and minerals, or they only draw up minerals from the soil for their own benefit. So if plants were becoming significantly lower in minerals, we don't have to test whole batches and compare them to the past. You just have to look at a damn field. Um, so these examples, this particular crop is not because I have a fascination with this, unlike Snoop Dogg. Um, they just, it's like the first images that genuinely come, elite, come up, at least on British Google, <laughs> when, when you look up nutritional deficiencies. You will instantly be able to tell by looking at crops. I think that's a, mag, uh, think that's a magnesium deficiency at the top and a calcium deficiency in the bottom. That you will be instantly able to notice those in a field. And if that was the case, then they would be corrected for by the agriculturist. Um, the other thing you can simply look at is the population. If crops were significantly lower in nutrition nowadays than in the past, you could logically expect there to be much, much higher incidences of malnutrition today versus in the past. Now, I'll give you an example. My dad's from Malaysia, uh, growing up in the 1950s on the northern tip of Borneo. He's a good 50 centimeters shorter than I am, and it's because he didn't get enough food when he was growing up. Um, it's a similar but less dramatic story from my mom's side of the family growing up in rural Wales during the Second World War. Children today are, have much, much better nutrition in every way, and it's because they get enough food. Now, it really doesn't matter if crops are marginally lower in some minerals today than they were in the past, even though the evidence is not there to even make that claim. But even if it were true, the fact that we actually get enough food for them really cancels that out. Um, and the other thing which you know, people mention is a terrible thing, and I hear it all the time, you know, imported food is terrible, local food is by definition better. My mum, growing up in the 1950s in rural Wales, basically, if she wanted fruit for like nine months of the year, it was a moldy apple. Like, actually making your minimum amount of five-a-day recommended fruit and vegetable intake, about 800 grams of fruit and vegetables a day, is essentially impossible if you live on my mum's latitude. It's only imports that have made that possible. Like, the lunch I had today, like, look at that damn salad. That's not grown here. The only way that we're able to get that is because of imports. So I'm not saying that the food system today is a panacea and is perfect. There are many things that are terrible about it. But I'm going to end on this last slide. This image shows us, instead of something that is terrible and something that needs to be fixed and something that is broken, it shows us the food supply that is the most affordable, the most varied, the safest, the most, uh, the most widely spread, and the most nutritious of any food supply in the history of our species. It's a food supply that my parents, when, like, from a very, very poor background, would have dreamt to have. It's a, parent, uh, it's a food supply that my grandparents could never have had. And it's all thanks to people like you in the room today. So thank you very much.